ended up going from there. We took a, a guided missile cruiser, jumped on that, and hauled ass all the way to Bahrain. We were in Bahrain for a little bit, uh, and then we were scheduled to go do some other shit, and then that's when the coal got hit. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A total of six sets of remains uh, have been found on board the coal during the course of today. Um, we are working to identify uh, the remains and to contact the next of kin uh, of those individuals. And that notification and identification process uh, continues as we speak. My prayers are with the families of those killed and injured and with all the brave men and women in uniform who serve our country every day around the world. So we jumped on the USS Tarla uh, and steamed down to, um, to the coal. And then we sat on the coal for two fucking months. And Rewind real quick. How uh, how much note? How many days passed between when the coal got hit and you guys arriving on the coal? It was like a day and a half, two days. I mean, it was quick. How fucking fired up were you guys to yeah, do super that? Fired up. I mean, it was it was nerve wracking and, and fired up at the same time. Uh, you know, jumping on a ship that's doing twelve miles an hour, kind of it's almost like the Austin Powers, you know, like, <laughs> where he's like getting ready to run the guy over and he sits there screaming for fucking two minutes, like. Uh, you know, there was an element of like, Jesus Christ, we need to get there, you know, and uh, it, it was a few days. Um, you know, it, it wasn't as quick as, you know, jumping on a plane and being there that day. But, uh, but you know, they weren't hanging out like dogs balls for too, too long. But um, yeah, it was it was nerve wracking because, again, this it's, it's hard to even put people in that frame of mind of this was still before September 11th, you know, yeah. so yeah. Um, Knowing that, you know, I mean, even the name Osama bin Laden, like, it was like, who? Yeah. Even then, it was like, Al-Qaeda, what the fuck is that? You know, like, I, I had a little bit more inclination on who they were and what they were about because I was the intel rep for the platoon and we were going to the Middle East. So I, I was a little more read in than, than most people. But uh, but it still, it wasn't obviously anywhere near like it is now. And, and so it was a, a bigger deal in that respect and that, you yeah. know, this is a U.S. warship that— Suicide bombers fucking pulled a, a tug laden with explosives alongside and blew themselves up. Um, interestingly, <clears throat> they tasked a guy to uh, to videotape that whole fucking thing, and uh, and he fell asleep and didn't get it on film. You know, their propaganda wing of Al Qaeda. I mean, I think they, I don't know if they executed him, but uh, you know, the, it came out years later that uh, that they had actually tasked a guy to, to get that on film. I, I kind of wish they had. You know, maybe yeah. maybe that's a sadistic, creepy thing to to think, but um, you know, for for their uses, you know, the propaganda tools are, are pretty powerful, but. Uh, I mean, that killed like uh, 15, 19. 19 sailors and then yeah. uh, a lot of casualties. Yeah, and it was, it was fucking creepy uh, for us because coming on board, you know, obviously the, the crew was to say that they were rattled is a fucking huge understatement, yeah. you know, uh, because the, the goal of, of the entire mission was to actually sink that fucking ship. You know, yeah. it wasn't just to, to bomb it. And the, the whole reason that we were there was because they threatened to to sink it. You know, they came came over the open airwave Marband radio uh, and threatened the captain. And they were like, you know, this is fucking Al Qaeda. Your ship is not leaving our fucking harbor. You know, we like we will sink it or, or whatever the fuck they said, something to that effect. And so that's why we went down there. And so we sat there for two months and from sundown to sun up every fucking night. We had two uh, ribs, two boats, you know, floating around with a couple guys on it. And then we had a 60-gunner and a couple snipers and a law rocket uh, guy on the bridge of the ship uh, kind of keeping, you know, overwatch. And, and we were out uh, on the boats. And there was there was a number of times where small boats would come, you know, test, test the perimeter and see what they could get away with and whatever. And we were always right there. Never mixed it up with them, but a couple of pretty, you know, fairly close calls where, um, you know, if if things had gone maybe a little different, it probably would have would have gone pretty bad for for the boats that were trying to come come any closer. But any uh, shots fired? Nothing. nothing. At, at least nothing uh, from any of the boats I was on, and I, I don't recall any any of the other guys having any. There was a couple of close calls where again it was like you know they went a little too close, and guys would get would haul ass out there and you know maybe draw down on them or the fucking. Um, you know, 50 cal guys on the rib and fucking yeah. you know, be like, hey, motherfucker, you know, or, or whatever. But 
so they they never really tried anything past that because I, I think they knew you know that it wasn't going to fucking pan out well for them. But where it was fucking creepy was um, going inside. You know, the first couple of days we were there, we actually you know we stayed on board the coal, and you know they had nineteen empty racks. Well, guess where we fucking slept? You know, so we're sleeping in these sailors' bunks that were just fucking blown Fuck. up. You know, and, and like, you know, there's USS Cole fucking coffee mugs with fucking like powder blasts on them in the Damn. galley and, and uh, you know, people's personal effects. And, you know, a lot of the crew like, you know, you're laying in some dude that, you know, the, the, the rest of the room is is fucking devastated and you're like laying in his bunk jerking off <laughs> no i'm kidding but uh but they're looking at you you know they're just they're looking at you like what the fuck you know like yeah. they just can't can't wrap their mind around it you know and it was we didn't know any of them so it was just very different for us coming on board but but uh you know it was, it was a powerful fucking moment for us because um it was the first you know kind of like holy shit you know this, yeah. this is a shit real just got real a real fucking deal and they're testing the water and and so uh there was also uh, the the stench from uh, you know being in ninety four degree fucking water salt water you know and having now a ship that has no running power on it uh, in terms of AC and stuff you know I had floodlights and, and stuff in some of the barracks rooms on enough generator power but nowhere near enough because of the damage to the ship to, to actually keep it cool and so uh, I mean it's just the the smell of of nineteen semi-submerged blown up dead bodies trapped in a fucking boat you know in that kind of water and that kind of heat day in day out for a couple of months was fucking brutal uh and there they was, were they, the bodies were in there so yeah they couldn't get them out uh, Jesus there, there was Christ. one instance where from about the knee down uh in in the galley so the the witness reports were when the uh when the the blast hit it hit during lunch and it was right at midships, which is where the galley was located in that uh, that area. And so everybody that was in there said that it was like a fuck. The floor was like a, a fucking sine wave. Like the floor went like yeah. that, you know, metal floor moving like a fucking wave from the blast. And uh, so there there was a section of the of the ship where the floor became the ceiling, and it just fucking meshed up, and, and that was it. And there was one spot where. As you're walking, you could actually see a fucking dungaree and a boondocker from about the knee down hanging out of the out of the fucking where now it's a ceiling. It was a floor, and now it's a ceiling. Somebody's fucking leg just hanging there, um, you know, right there, fucking plain as day. And and then the other uh, eighteen people were, you know, in, in different parts of the boat, fucking mangled and and uh, dead, just sitting there, fucking rotting. But fuck, man. Yeah. So you guys, um, damn. How long? Uh, how long were you guys on there? Two months. Two. So, that boat sat in that uh, harbor and and ate in for two fucking months. Two fucking months. Yeah. So you can imagine, like the smell didn't get any fucking better. And the, and the bodies were there the entire the time. time. Yeah. What? Um, how'd you guys get the boat out? So the the USS Marlin Spike, which was a floating die drop, came from Louisiana and came all the way out, and it took you know between spinning them up and outfitting it to, to accommodate the coal and all of that. It took two fucking months to get there, 63 days. And uh, they came about 12 miles off the coast. And then they took uh, tugs and bumper boats and shit and, and drug the coal out to it. And, uh, and then so the way the, the floating dry dock works is it's this monster fucking boat, right? And it has the ability to, to sink itself they drag the boat on and then it raises back up. And so, I mean, you can Google pictures of Marlin Spike and Cole and you'll see this fucking ship that has a, a USS warship that looks like it's a fucking toy on it. It's it's that much bigger, you know, so it it, it fucking dry docks the, uh, the coal on a boat and then it's steamed all the way back to Louisiana. Damn. Took them a couple of years to uh, completely re refurbish the ship, but they did. They completely repaired it. And, uh, and uh, to my knowledge, it's actually back out. Uh, back out at sea and doing deployments again. But uh, one thing, while it was being drug out there, because it took you know a couple of days, you know, because it was the one thing it was it was severely listed. I mean, I don't know how the fuck it didn't sink. Honestly, I mean, I think it speaks volumes to the crew for doing such a good job, uh, damage control wise, of having all their ducks in a row and, and handling their processes the way they were supposed to, because they kept the the boat from sinking. It's a monster fucking hole in it. 
And uh, <clears throat> so it took them forever to, dra to drag it out. Well, while it was being drug out, we actually got spun up to do a, a shipboarding. You know, we, we had thought like finally, you know, 63 days of night after night fucking guarding this goddamn thing. You know, it's, it's dragging out and, and now we can kind of relax. Well, on its way out, there was a fucking boat hauling ass straight towards it you know, that, that our ship picked up on the radar. So they spun us up. We get all our shit on, hop in the ribs, go fucking assault this uh, this little miniature fucking tug tanker thing that uh, was. It turned out it was just bringing oil um, out out to the Marlin Spike. I guess there was, you know, they didn't deconflict or whatever, but there was a, a Yemeni uh, army officer with a with a fucking Beretta on board, and then the rest was just a crew. And, and of course, we assaulted it like like it was Al Qaeda coming back yeah. to fuck, you know. We almost shot and killed the fucking Yemeni guy because he uh, he kind of had an attitude and started to put his hand on his fucking pistol. And uh, Clint Emerson and I uh, actually were the two guys that um, zeroed in on him and fucking just swarmed him and backed him up. And he was like, oh, shit, you know, he had MP5s down his fucking throat. And uh, and he got his hand off his gun immediately and decided yeah, he, did. he didn't want to fuck around. But uh, so, you know, once we finally got that done, um, then we, we actually did a follow on up with uh because of that is so at the time uh you know u.s ships were pulling in everywhere and that's that's what was happening with the coal in yemen is they were just pulling in for a resupply um and so once that happened uh the u.s navy said no more resupplies anywhere other than dubai no. or actually jebel ali which is just south of dubai and so we went to dubai we jumped on a on a usns fucking merchant marine ship and hauled ass to uh to dubai and we were in plain clothes, relaxed grooming, grooming standards, fucking cover stories, the whole bit. Uh, and every fucking Navy ship that came in, we would uh, dive on the tugboats and ensure that uh, that they didn't have any bombs on them or explosives or whatever. Went through the whole warehouse personnel pallets. We had a sniper overwatch on one of the towers. I mean, we had a whole fucking thing going on of, uh, of every time a ship pulled in, we made sure that that shit wasn't going to happen. So we spent about a month in Dubai doing that. Do you remember what your cover was? It, it was fucking lame. It was just like we were government contractors oh, doing okay. like electrical work or something stupid like that. It wasn't anything fancy. Of course, if we were out in town, we were a fucking American rugby team or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, well, uh, did you, you know, Yemen is, uh, Yemen is a uh, very fucked up place. And uh, I deployed there uh, several times. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, probably doesn't mean shit to you, but I got to see where the, you know, coal happened. I used to drive by it every fucking day. No shit. And, yeah, and um, and uh, me and Glover had a couple incidents there, and uh, uh, there was always shit going on in uh, in Yemen, especially in Aden. Did you guys get to go out in town at all, or? Nope we uh, we were on the ship or in that port area, and that was it. You know, okay. So we had very limited uh, exposure experience to to any of the actual local populace. I mean, a little bit from. You know, people coming and checking it out or, you know, interacting with people on, on board or whatever. I do remember uh, it just kind of flashed in my memory. You know, at that time I was, uh, I think I just turned 21 um, right before we deployed on that. And uh, so, you know, as a 21-year-old, like I'm still pretty young, you know, by parent standards and whatever. And so anyway, on a sat phone, I scared the shit out of my parents, uh, you know, because they heard about it in the news and they and they knew I was overseas and they hadn't heard from me in a while. And all of a sudden I call them and my dad like had had gone home like he'd forgot something and, and went back, you know, after lunch and went back into the house. And, uh, you know, because even this was before really people, everybody had cell phones. Uh, and so I call him on a sat phone at, at the house phone and he picked up and he hadn't heard from me in weeks. I was like, guess where I'm staying? And he's like, where? I was like. On, on board the fucking USS Cole oh, half sunk shit. in the water. He's like, what? <laughs> he's like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, you know, he's having a heart attack. Like, what the fuck are you doing there? Are you okay? You know, all this other shit. And, uh, but yeah, it's just it was one of those moments where, uh, you know, almost like fate, like he, I, I wouldn't have gotten a hold of him otherwise. But, uh, you know, I had the, had the opportunity to call him and uh, it was just kind of neat. We, we look back on that and laugh once in a while. But, yeah. You know, it, um, just backtracking a little bit more too. Uh, even though there was no shots fired, um, just for the audience, I think that always kind of surprises me because there hasn't been shit going on, you know. And uh, you, you spent two years at the fucking team preparing to go to war, 
and uh, and uh, like when I showed up, we knew what we were gonna do, and there was nothing going. And then this happens, which you know gives you the adrenaline, and uh, and and I'm assuming the entire platoon was hungry as fuck to get some action, and. I guess where I'm going is the discipline that it takes to not shoot a uh, potential threat when you know you can fucking get away with is, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, there's something to be said about that, you know, and uh, a lot of units don't have that fucking discipline. And, and, uh, that's one of the things that separates, uh, special operations units from conventional units. So, uh, I just want to kind of, uh, reiterate that or bring awareness on how much fucking discipline that actually takes i mean yeah. I, well yeah i appreciate it i think and i agree i think half of it uh, is what you're talking about in terms of you know having clear thinking you know not overly aggressive people you know knowing when to use aggression how to apply it and also when to turn it the fuck off when it's appropriate when it's not uh you know and being clear-headed to know the difference is is uh necessary but I also think there's an element of leadership that uh, exists, at least within our chain of command at that time it did, where we knew absolutely what the fucking right and left flank were, yeah. was. You know, there was a, here is, here is our fucking bubble and nobody comes inside that. I don't care if they're five inches from it, you don't fucking engage them. You know, and so they, they were smart enough to, to see and test you know, our, our perimeter and see, you know, if we go here, what happens if we go like, and, and so we would ratchet it up where, you know, if they were getting close, we'd, we'd start heading that way, you know, and they'd get to a certain point and they'd fucking full throttle it out to the edge. And then, so that, you know, they honestly like a fucking dog that is testing a goddamn electric fence, you know, that that's yeah. basically what they were doing. And so, you know, they, they were measuring our response uh, as it relates to to their behavior and and figured out how far they could get and, and what we were going to do and that, yeah there were a couple of times where uh, you know we made it abundantly clear like any fucking further and and your your fucking history yeah and I think they just recognized that and decided you know what we'll live to fight another day and and this isn't worth it yeah I mean even just the revenge factor you know I mean fuck yeah. you're eating chow with fucking yeah decaying legs hanging through the ceiling and yeah. uh you know which are americans and uh, and uh, our brothers and sisters you know that are serving so uh fucking kudos to you man and your team and well, clint yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you know it's funny I, I talked a little bit about this with uh, nick and remy talking about race and and policing and not to get too off on a tangent but the i think the, the one of the starkest contrasts between the u.s military and u.s police forces is is that is that you know it's there's elements of police and granted not all of them there's plenty of them that, that aren't that way but there I, I think that there are there are too many holdovers of when things happen you know there's times where cops get away with shit that they probably shouldn't you know and there's almost never a time where that happens in the military yeah you know like you fuck up this it's like the Top Gun quote you fuck up this much you're gonna be <laughs> flying a rubber a, a cargo plane full of rubber dog shit out of Hong Kong right. Is that, you know, you fuck up that much and you're going to be breaking big rocks into little rocks at Leavenworth and everybody fucking knows that. Yeah. You know, and so to me, like, that's the, that's really the secret sauce. It's not even in selection or training or whatever that's going to take years of, of revamping and, and billions of fucking dollars in funding. It's like have, have an accountability system so stringent that, that people know absolutely like you, you fucking, this is okay. This isn't okay. Have the leadership, you know, with enough directive and balls and, and ability to communicate what, you know, the, the black and white contrasted right and left flank are so that guys understand what the fuck they're allowed to do and, and what they're not allowed to do, you know, and I think yeah. the military just does a way better job at that. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.